gosh, is my mic on? Yes. Cool. Hey, thanks for coming, guys. Um, also, I'd like to thank Yoko for inviting me to Meltdown this year. It's a, it's a, it's a big honor, and uh, wow, I'm glad you guys showed up. Uh, and didn't all go to the Iggy show. Um, <laughs> anyway, we'll explain what all this is as we go along, and to do that, I'm going to bring out my buddy uh, Mark Adams. Some of you may know as Mr. Total Blam Blam. Uh, okay, he gets a bigger hand than me. Come on out, Blamo. <laughs> uh, Hi, guys. I have, why do I have headphones? <laughs> Silence from the roof. How's it going? You looking good, Earl? Good, good, thank you. Um, so, diary, diary of a Sideman, what's that all about? Um, basically what's going on is um, Diary of a Sideman is a book in progress. So I know you guys have seen some blurbs on the internet about a book. It's being written. So um, as far as a, a publishing date, we will keep everybody posted on the internet about when, when that's going to be. Um, the idea of the book, um, everybody's done a book about a person they've worked with before. You know, in my case, would be a lot of it would be with David Bowie and a number of other people. The book's going to be about me and my experiences um, as, as a sideman. And a sideman is the guy who's next to the big guy, the support guy. I'm there to work with David Bowie and John Lennon and a number of other people. Um, you know, to make their records and, and, and do their live shows and, and be support and be there as, as a band member to support the main act. And the book will be about me, but it will also be about a lot of other guys who have done, have, have taken the same path um, that I've taken. And, um, you know, do we have any photos up here yet? Oh, there I am. At the beginning. Um, that's a little 20 year old me. Um, and that was a band I had at the time. I think it was Bojack. And um, so, before we start, that, where did you get the name Earl Slick? Did Earl, Earl Slick it? came from the singer of that band. Yeah. Who, 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 we, when we were doing a lot of club dates in New York back in, in, the, in the early '70s uh, and late '60s, uh, he, to make it interesting, because we would do five shows a night, 45-minute shows a night, five days a week. So to keep yourself busy, besides getting drunk. Um, we, you know, he thought it was very funny, so every night he would introduce the band and he would change our names on a nightly basis. So you, he would come up with some whoppers. And um, I, I grew up in Brooklyn, and, and uh, a Brooklyn accent pronounces things a bit odd sometimes, especially back in the day. So I wouldn't say the oil, I would say Earl. Okay, and then there was oil, and then I was called slick, and then oil slick, Earl Slick, and I got stuck with this thing when I was about 19. So the first record I ever made, a real album that came out on Capitol with some band called Tracks, which I was also a side man on, I was a gun for hire, they said, how do you want to be credited? Because my real name is Frank Madaloni. It, it, it didn't sound very rock and roll. <laughs> it sounded like something you bought in an Italian restaurant to eat for dinner. And I, I thought, you know, I, I, this Earl Slick thing's kind of cool. I said, well, what the hell, just stick it on there. And that's who I am now, when I'm here. Um, when I'm in Brooklyn, it's Frankie. So at the beginning, you... Ah. Do you want to point yourself out? Actually, the, the culprit for my name is the guy standing up. Okay. I am directly to his right, sitting down. That's what I looked like when I was, I don't know, 19 or 20. And, oh, where's my little pointer? I have a pointer thing here. Let me... Beware. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. It's working. That's me. And that would be about 19, uh, that could be 68 or 69. Um, and that was another band called Mack Truck, which I didn't like as much as that band. But um, anyway, it's up there. The idea wasn't to be, I didn't, you know, I saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show and I thought, wow, the girls are screaming, the guys are wearing these cool clothes and look at them haircuts or lack thereof haircuts, right? And back in the day, you know, in 1964, uh, that haircut was like, it really pissed our parents off something awful. It was like, I've got to have one of those. Uh, and um, 
You know, because rock and roll back then, it was, it was about that. It was, you know, pissing off the teachers and, and, and mom and dad and aunts and uncles and pretty much everybody within your view. Uh, and I saw them and I wanted to be in a band. So I learned how to play my guitar and, and did the whole process and got together with neighborhood kids and, um, and, and started bands. And, and my, my goal really was to have my own band that would be signed to a record contract by, you know, when I was in my early 20s. And um, we came close, but before that happened, um, a friend of mine named Michael Kamen, is he up there next? There he is. Uh, Michael was my mentor, God rest his soul. I mean, he really helped me out. Um, he believed in me. He believed in me as, as, as a guitarist and an artist and a person. And whenever gigs would come up, Michael would always get me an audition for whoever it was. What, Remember year, I, what kind of year would this be? This is around also about 1971-ish, okay. maybe 72. So that's quite a leap forward there from um, seeing the Beatles and the Stones as well. Oh, yeah, the and the whole time in between there, I was playing constantly. Yeah. Um, were you doing covers mainly with those bands, those early bands? We, we, this was really funny because we... we we were doing covers, yeah. but then we would get these, because um, a lot of these club owners would say, well, we only take cover bands, okay? So we would sneak in obscure tracks from uh, certain cover band, for, uh, like a Stones track that wasn't yeah. well known, and, and then we would stick one of ours in that we wrote that was similar to that one and say it was also <laughs> from that same Stones album. So this is, we would, and oh, this is a really obscure track that the Stones did. It's a B-side, and, you know, it's one of ours. Yeah. So, you know, it was our way of being able to play our own music. Right, okay, and so Michael Kamen, who saw you about. So Mike, Michael um, helped me out in a lot of ways, and he actually made the introduction uh, uh, between me and David Bowie in 1974. Were you already aware of Bowie at this point? Did oh, yeah, know? absolutely. I mean, um, Ziggy had come out, and it was huge, and... and I really loved Aladdin Sane um, was the first Bowie record that I really had gotten into. Yeah. So I was aware of, of, of Bowie, and uh, at the time, you know, Did you he see was, him on any of those shows? And, and I, you know what? He was on, um, we had a show called Midnight Special. Yeah, um, the 1980 Floor show thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and he did all that stuff, so I'd yeah. seen him on there. Okay. Um, anyway, Michael got me an audition, and uh, quite uh, the audition it was. Uh, what happened there exactly? You did you, you knew it was for Bowie, but was he there at the audition? Was it? he was? Um, I had um, been called to RCA Studios in New York, um, you know, for the audition, and I showed up and I expected to see a band and David Bowie and, and all that, and there was a recording studio, and I walked in and I was instructed through somebody on the other side of the glass to, with an American accent to put headphones on, which I knew it wasn't Bowie, and said. Um, we're going to play a track, and you play to it. And, and I said, what key is it? And they go, just play. I said, all right. <laughs> what are the chords? Just play. So I put the phones on. I played for a little bit. And then they played a little bit of this and a, and a bit of that. And I was just playing along with stuff I'd never heard before. And I sat there a minute. And they go, hang on. And then David walks in the room. And we just sat down and, and sort of he had a guitar, and I had a guitar. And we just chatted and had a beer or something. And um, uh, was there any pressure on you when you were doing that to be anybody else? I mean, you were aware of his history. You knew that he'd just finished with Mick Ronson. But was there anything that um, made you think you should be doing anything apart from what you would normally do? No, because, because I, I was such an arrogant little shit that I just yes. thought, I'm, <laughs> I'm just going to come in and play like me, and as much as I want this gig, he's either going to like me or hate me, so it really doesn't matter. Well, it worked, yeah. And it worked. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, um, you know, his assistant had come in, after we had spoken for a while, and she goes, well, we'll call you back within the next couple of weeks because we've got a dozen other guys to look at. And I go, Jesus Christ, this is going to be a long two weeks. Plus, I, I, I was I, trying I, to keep it quiet because, you know, you don't want to tell all your mates that you've been out there auditioning for Bowie, and then you don't get the gig, and then, then you've got to move out of town. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you're done. I thought, I can't face the world. Well, as it turns out, a, a buddy of mine, the only guy that I told about it, that actually drove me to the audition, I told everybody at the pub. So we come back from the audition, and I walk in, and everybody's clapping. I'm going, you son of a bitch. I, so luckily, the phone did ring the next day with uh, David's assistant and, and said, uh, David, would like you to join up with the band. Would you like to come up and have a meeting? And 
That was the start of the David Bowie. Oh, that was for the Diamond Dogs tour. And, and yeah, we went directly into rehearsals for Diamond Dogs, um, which um, gave birth to the uh, David Live at the Tower um, in Philly live album. Great album. Uh, one of great my solos. One, Day thank Dream, you. But, yeah. One of my favorites. Yeah. Um, what have we got on there, Mark? Keep me in line. Well, the thing was that um, at that point, for the Diamond Dogs tour itself, you were, it was a choreographed show to some degree. Were you ever um, instructed to do anything? I mean, there's the big thing about people who are behind the scenery, etc. but that's not apparent from photographs, but there was all this stuff going on at the front of the stage. Well, well there was a lot going on on the stage. Yeah. We, we, we were not behind screens, you know, as, as it was been reported. You could yeah. see us. Um, and um, one thing that, that um, it was choreographed. I wasn't choreographed. I wasn't very choreographable. So David just kind of gave up on the idea. And, and that was that. So I was just able to do what I did. You know, I mean, I can't work like that. And I guess he put two and two together and, and, and just let me alone to do what I do. And that, the Diamond Dogs tour mutated into the Philly Dogs and Young Americans thing. And then you went on to record with David for Young Americans. And at the same point, um, Lennon came in on the scene for fame and across the universe. Yeah. During the course, there's this whole... I mean, it's not like now we're like, well, especially this last record we did with David with a nine-year gap. Uh, we didn't have nine-year gaps. You know, we had like nine-week gaps, and we would make no records. But there was, we had done the, the Diamond Dogs tour, then the, the uh, Young Americans, which was uh, John Lennon was involved in on, on writing and performing on fame and across the universe, um, some of which I don't really remember that well. It's a kind of a blank <laughs> spot in there. And, and I'll refer back to that in a little while. Okay, um, we'll, we'll come back to that. But then after that tour, you did your own thing. Um, you had the Arslick Band and you did Razor Sharp. Right, we, um, there was a, um, a bit of a falling out, um, of course, by some unscrupulous type manager folks. Um, this was, I should say, this was after Station to Station. This is after yeah. Station to Station was done, which, yeah. which was one of my favorite records. And right before the tour, um, a few things had happened, which will be in the book in detail. But, um, but um, at the moment, let's just say things went kind of wrong and me and David parted ways. And I, I'd already signed the Capitol Records, so I took my band out. Uh, we did two albums. One of them we did here, up in um, near the Power Station in... Um, what, Battersea? Battersea, yeah. Yeah, at the Who's studio uh, back then. And you, do, you initially did some stuff with Mick Ronson as well, didn't you? Well, Mick Ronson originally, on the first album that I did, had, had produced the original demos and did the, the, the pre production. And then the record company at the time said that he didn't have enough track record or a big enough name to produce the record. I was like, what? <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, we ended up using Harry Maslin, who did work on, on Station to Station and Young Americans. And the result was good. Um, and anyway, we did the two slick albums. We did some touring, and uh, that went the way of a lot of bands. We started fighting, and we exploded. And you got married to, to Jane Millington. I, and in band. the meantime, I, I got married right as that band was breaking up um, uh, to the bass player from a band that was very popular here, actually, in the early 70s named Fanny. They were the first. They're up here, yeah. Um, where is she? Oh, that's Jane. There she is. Um, and... Um, they were the first really self-contained girl rock and roll band that got signed to a major label at the time. So um, got married during that period of time. And then um, I'd been on the road a lot. And there was, a, there was another gap in there, a slight one, yeah. where after that... You were doing some stuff with Ian Hunter With, as well, with Ian Hunter. Uh, it was, seems that every time Mick Ronson left a job, I ended up with it. <laughs> I don't... <laughs> And, and the weird thing about that was, is, is you think it would cause competition. What happened is, as a result of that, me and Mick became really close friends, which was, you know, and drinking buddies, and it was, because we could kind of compare notes, you know? Um, so he had left Ian, and Ian formed a band called the Overnight Angels, which I was part of. And um, we did um, one album up in Canada with Roy Thomas Baker, <coughs> who produced, um, well, anybody here knows Queen. Okay, Roy Thomas Baker produced the, the main Queen albums, the big ones, and the Cars, and a whole lot of other people, and he produced the album. Um, 
I think these pictures are trying to get you to say something oh, about what that was. Roy also burnt the house down. Um, <laughs> I wasn't supposed to say that, but I, I'm saying it. Um, he was up maybe having a, tipping a few too many and somehow lit the house on fire with us in it in the snow. And um, luckily for, 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 for him, I mean, he was the only, oh no, real snow. We were up in the mountains in Canada, I mean, four feet of snow. Or what is that, a meter and change? Yes. <laughs> How, however you guys measure your snow here. Um, in millimeters most of the time, right? I mean, it's not much. I mean, uh, anyway, everybody's out of the house but Roy. And long story short, he had jumped out the back balcony and was buck naked in four feet of snow. And me and Ian grabbed him and stuck him in the four-wheel drive and waited for the fire brigade. I said that right, right? Yep. Yeah, OK. Not the fire department, as we call it. The fire brigade came, and um, anyway, we tour We actually did do a lot of touring in Europe, and, and the album was only released in Europe. Um, so we toured with the Overnight Angels here in 1977, and actually recorded a single called "England Rocks" with Bill Price after the album was done. It was put on as a bonus track, and it was done in the same studio that "Nevermind the Bollocks" was recorded in by uh -huh. the same engineer which was actually my favorite track on the whole record. I, I loved it. And um, we toured that. Um, and then business went sideways with that one. Um, and, uh, and you got involved with Mick again in, in 79. Oh, th this basically was, was it now, okay, so, so now the Ian, the Ian Slick band broke up. I'm gone. Mick's back in the band again. Now he's taking my place. So this has been going on now for like four years, four or five years. Um, and anyway, they, they had come to visit L.A., and, and they came over the house, and, and it was great. I got invited out, and I, and I got to play with Mick and Ian. And it was just a one-off night thing, but, you know, it's, it's, um, it was good. Just to reverse very quickly, because I don't think many people know this. Jean, your wife, yeah. didn't she sing on a Bowie track? Yeah, um, my wife Jean sang uh, backup vocals on Fame, actually, and it, it, before I knew her. Right, great. I mean, matter of fact, I don't think I, uh, when I looked at the credits of the album later on, and I saw my name, and, and, and I saw Lennon's name, and I saw her name, and I wouldn't even, didn't know that the other two even played on it right away. <laughs> it was the 70s, guys. It's a bit blank. <laughs> that, actually, that period's about the blankest of blank. Yeah. And some yeah. of it will come back as we're, uh, hopefully as we go along interviewing and writing the book, um, Maybe I'll have to get hypnotized or something. We'll find it. It's, it, it's, it's in there. We just got to look for it. I think that's you and David both. Anyway, that brings us up to 90. <laughs> David who? <laughs> um, then you, you got a call to do some session work. Who was that for? About and this 19... would be 1980? Correct. Ah. This would be my manager at the time, Trudy Green, gets a phone call from Jack Douglas, um, who produced um, a lot of early uh, John Lennon recordings. Um, <clears throat> as well as Cheap Trick and Aerosmith, and I really like Jack. And I had just signed a record contract, another uh, band of mine, getting a chance not to be a sideman again. And I wanted Jack to Who produce... Who was that band? What's that? It was called Silver Condor. Right. It was... Um, it was it, it, it went extinct like condors did at the time. It, it, <laughs> it, it was not it wasn't protected, um, but we wanted we wanted Jack to do the record, and the record company for some reason decided they didn't want him, so they pushed a different guy on us. Um, and and I had to kind of like make the apologetic call to Jack. I said, look, it's it's the record company, and and he was I guess he was okay. I thought he was mad at me, but the phone rings to my manager, and it's him. Um, explaining that, that he's producing an artist and, and he would like me to play on the record, but he can't tell us who it is. I just love that one. <laughs> we have a big artist and it's huge and it's going to be great. Well, who is it? I can't tell you. You're like, oh no, you know. Um, and did you have an inkling? It, you know, at first, I, I kept racking my brain and I'm going, who could it be that's that big that it would be a secret? And I go, it has to be somebody who hasn't done anything for a while. I don't think that, that Jack Douglas would be producing David Bowie. It's just not, it's not a fit. It's not a good right. fit, different thing. I'm going so that was your first thought, though, was it, that it could be Well, Bowie then I started it? going backwards and going, yeah. okay, I know that Cheap Trick and Aerosmith are both intact as bands. Who else has he done? I said, duh, Lennon. So I had an inkling that it was John. Okay. 
So you went um, to the session, you were, you were invited to the session, and you knew at this point it was John, and didn't you get there early and bef before you were actually asked to get there? Or yeah, no? um, not that I was excited or anything to play on a John Lennon yeah. record, but I got there like a few hours early. <laughs> well, first of all, I, I mean, you know, uh, the funny thing is, is having already been around the block, what's up there? That's, um, oh. oh my God, that's my daughter at nine months old, my daughter Marita, who is now 33, sitting on John's <laughs> lap. And, oh, okay, that is the first day. There I am lurking in the top left corner, um, but. That's the first day of recording. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I remember John in that exact, he must have been in that chair for four hours because that photo's taken after we'd been in there for a while. But um, anyway, I got there early thinking that I was gonna beat everybody in, I could relax, not have a nervous breakdown because I'm playing on a John Lennon record. And I walk in and the whole place is empty except he's sitting in that chair in the middle of the floor all by himself. And I go, uh-oh, all right. So I go in and I introduce myself and, and John says, uh, it's great to see you again. I said, really, have we met before? <laughs> and, and I'm like thinking, okay. Um, and apparently during the Young American sessions when we did uh, Across the Universe and, and Fame, I guess we, we were in the studio at the same time, according to John. According to me, we weren't. And, and, and uh, long story short, the, the running jump was, is, is, is I said, well, I, I would think I would remember a Beatle if I was in the studio <laughs> with one early on. And it was, an on, it was kind of an ongoing little, little joke for the duration of the recording of, of, of the sessions. But uh, pretty uh, pathetic if you've done that and you forgot. I mean. Did the sessions, um, the experience of recording with Lennon, how did it? compared to w recording with Bowie? Was it a, s a similar kind of thing of up all night and uh, sessions as long as they um, wanted them or was it quite a different no, setup? No, no, the, the hours were different. Right. Whereas Bowie didn't have hours, the, he, we had days. Uh, where John was working with reasonable hours but the process was, was very similar in that um, both Bowie and, and, and uh, John Lennon would, they picked musicians specifically that did things that worked inside the framework of the record that they wanted to make. Um, so you weren't expected to like read these exact notes because I would have been out of a job if that was the case because he had the session guys to do that. And my job was to, to add the, a little bit of rock and roll and street element to it, which is the same way that Bowie works. I mean, um, the best records I've ever made and the best artists I've worked with are the ones that want you, they want to pull out of you what you do naturally. Okay. And in that way, they are, they were similar. And I mean, it was an, the setup for recording, you would break for lunch and everything with Lennon. Oh yeah, with, with Lennon it was great, it was like a family, you know. Um, we had the picture earlier, this, this is, what's this here going on here? Um, and it was your child sat on Lennon's lap earlier as well, wasn't it? Should that one right there, yeah, that's yeah. Gene, yeah. and then Yoko, and John, and my daughter again, and then me with some kind of goofy haircut. Um, <laughs> and that's actually taken in the control room of the Hit Factory in New York City where we recorded, that's during the Double Fantasy sessions, that photo. Um, and then we would have a, 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 a lunch break every day, and we had, the lounge was really tiny, but we'd all crowd in there and hang out and just have like a family, like a family lunch. It was, it was, really, it was really great. And during those sessions, you obviously recorded what later became, um, you, you recorded a lot of work with Lennon but that didn't all come out on Double Fantasy. Right, we, w the idea was is that we recorded two works at the same, two albums at the same time. One of them later on came out as Milk and Honey, but they were all recorded obviously at the same time because as we well know after December of 1980, John was no longer with us. So um, Milk and Honey is, was going to be worked on and finished later on, but it was released as is a few years later. But so was it considered a, another album as you were doing it, when you were doing? No, what, what, what was happening was, is that he said, we're, gonna re we're just gonna keep recording. Right, okay. Then we're gonna pick these songs for the first record, yeah. and then the rest of them I'm gonna put for the second record, okay. and then we're gonna write some new ones and put those on there. And then Yoko put out Seasons of Glass as well. Yeah, and then um, in March of 1981, we went back in the studio 
with the same band and Yoko, and we did Season of Glass, yeah. um, which was a, 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 um, a very pensive period of time, but I think it was a good healing for everybody. I think Yoko made a good call on that because it got the same band, all of us, back in a room four months after the fact, and I think it really did help us all to get through some of the grief that we were feeling, including Yoko. And Walking on Thin Ice, which um, didn't appear on either of the albums initially, did it? Um, what, was, what, was the, what was the deal with that? Was that done as a separate track? I no, Walking on, Thin, is, I don't, Walking on Thin Ice is kind of an anomaly because it was recorded at the same time as we yeah. did all the double fantasy stuff. And actually the last thing that John actually ever played on, wasn't it? Right, it was. Yeah. I mean, um, we had done the guitars, and then John went back in and put another guitar on it. And um, it was actually not on the album. Yeah. I think it was going to be a separate entity. I'm not really sure what it was. Okay. So then you got um, another call from somebody that you'd worked with previously. We're up to 83 now. Would that be the DB guy again? That's yeah. the chap, yeah. Right. Uh, with so even more choreography. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, 1983, um, back you to got, the... You got a telegram, I believe. Oh, oh, that, <laughs> yeah. Um, can you appear, like, immediately to, to learn a three-hour show to Brussels? Like, and meanwhile, so I'm getting ready to go and I look at my passport, and it was expired. <laughs> and I went, oh, my God. So we had to get the passport, and, and the office actually gave me this to bring in to help out with a passport and the tickets and you know all the stuff that we needed to do to get me over to Brussels and to learn this whole this is the this is the side man's curse. Uh, our guy just quit. Can you come in and take his place? And, and in the meantime, you've got to learn a three-hour show and you've got three days to do it. It's like, whoa. Um, and at that point, the shows were a completely different thing. So it it, it went massive. And they, they, how did you feel playing those kind of shows compared to the shows you had been doing earlier? It, it was a different atmosphere, it was a different band, and the shows were bigger. Yeah. I mean, we were doing stadiums at the time. Um, there was a lot of staging going on, uh, but a bit less choreography, and as, and as usual, none for me. And was it literally that way? You just did what you want, and David let you do that? Yeah. It kind of had no choice. Right, fair enough. <laughs> and so from that point, that went on. That whole world tour stretched soon after that. You went on to the Phantom Rocker and Slip thing. Let's address, let's, there's a little sandwich in there, a little side note, is that part of the idea of doing the book is, is, is like, you know, um, telling the story of like what you guys see what we do and your perception of it is, is partially correct. And, but in some ways it's not, because there's other parts of it you don't know. So what I want to accomplish with the book is to, is to say, you know, yes, it was great, and yes, it did these good things, but then on the other hand, there's downsides to it too, because you don't have any control over things. So after we did a year on the road with the um, Let's Dance album with the Sirius Moonlight Tour, um, there was another album called Tonight that I was supposed to play on, and the phone just doesn't ring. And... You know, were you actually on hold for that as far as you oh, were concerned? Yeah, I was on hold for it. Right. And I found out from a band member, I called up and he said, oh, by the way, yeah, we, we're recording a record. Nobody ever called me. So, you know, um, these are the, it's just part of the thing, you know. I mean, it's... Uh, and that was tonight. So it's perhaps an album that you're not too upset you weren't involved with. No. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's cool. See, he can say it. He can say it. Well, you're already on Young Americans from Station to Station, by the way. Hey, I'm, I'm yeah. good. I'm yeah. good, man. Yeah, yeah anything <laughs> that you think I shouldn't be saying, it's up to you, man. Um. I think there's a few people might agree with <laughs> Always get the other guy to say the negative thing. Um, where are we now? We're in 1984. Well, these, oh, these pictures. this is pretty cool. When we were doing the US Festival, um, uh, we went out to the desert and did some shots. That's an old, old abandoned something or other, I don't know what it was. And, um, oh, you just oh that picture there. that's in my house. David doing some sort of regal pose like he was about to be knighted, I don't know. Um, and I think the back of my head's in there somewhere. Yeah, can just see you there. Yeah, that was during a short break during the tour. And 
So you didn't hear anything in 84 for the recording. What did you do next? Was that, was that John Wayne? Oh, 1984, I ended up um, coming over and, and I stayed in London for a little while. I had a flat down um, in Notting Hill. There we go, John Wayne, yeah. And then uh, ended up with uh, another Brit, John Waite, who is holding my daughter. And she's hanging out with all the rock stars, that kid. Uh, and Quincy Jones is to right to her left. And um, the bodyguard of somebody was off to the other side. I think it's John's bodyguard. And um, I was in London, and I got a phone call from the record company, which is the same record company that Bowie was on, saying, that John's guitar player, John Wayne's guitar player, just quit and we got a hit record, can you fill in? This, here comes the side man's, the blessing and the curse at the same time. So went ahead and did that most of 1984. Okay. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. You have to read the rest of the good stuff on that in the book. So then, you got, you, you uh, Keith Richards. Yes. He was probably your biggest idol, I would imagine. Oh, Keith point. Richards. Um, from the time I was like 13, as much as I was a Beatles fan, uh, Keith, I just got the Keith bug when I was a kid. I still have it. I mean, I still love Keith. I love the Stones and um, had played on a track of all things. Um, remember the, the Bowie and uh, Lennon, uh, um, the Bowie no, and Jagger? Is, this was 85, yeah. Yeah, so, Dancing yeah. in the Streets. For that start, for the, um, for the Live Aid. For the Live yeah. Aid. Yeah. And I played guitar on that, not at Bowie's request, but at Jagger's <laughs> request. Yeah, <that's> <laughs> Weird, huh? And how did that come about? Jagger phoned you directly? Yeah, he phoned yeah. me directly because my, my producers were, were, were actually, that were doing my Phantom Rocker and Slick record, which was yeah. the band I had with Slim Jim Phantom and Lee Rocker from the Stray Cats. Um, you did a couple of albums of those. Yes. And um, anyway, during mixing my record, he was doing this thing with Jagger and he wanted to replace the guitar. So I came in to do it, um, was invited to Mick's birthday party and ran into Keith. And um, there was a track on the record called My Mistake that was one of, and it was a very Stonesy track. And I asked him if he could play on it. And, and he just said, you know, where do I show up and when do I show up? Just call my, my management. This and is Keith you're talking about now. Yeah, yeah. this is yeah. Keith Richards, yeah. Yeah. So which which is another serious highlight. But how did that go? Uh, the recording of that. Were you there at the time? <laughs> Keith showed up a couple days late. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a commitment that I had to do in in the Virgin Islands. Drink, so drinking. Uh, it's, 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 it's a vague thing. But I think I was drunk in the Virgin Islands while Keith was doing it. That, that I mean, it's uh, what a thing a to miss. There. There's a shot of the rest of the guys. Yeah, no, yeah, I'm not there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's and that's Steve Thompson over to the right, the producer, and that's Michael Barbiero on the left, the engineer. You can see Keith and then Lee Rocker with the. Red shirt and Slim Jim Phantom with the Maryland shirt. Is it a Maryland shirt? Yeah, yeah, yeah Maryland, yeah. Okay, so after that, um, you did a Carl Perkins thing. Um, you, you're in lots of different bands, and you talk about the, the 80s decadence, about the many guitars. Here we go. There's a oh, that's just <laughs> 80s. Look at that. Is that 80s? That is, I mean. You still got most of those? Um. No, I got a couple. Of, I mean, look at those. Would you want to keep those? <laughs> it, it was frightening. <laughs> and around the same time, you did a thing with Carl Perkins, your side man again, which... Um, the Carl Perkins, I, I, you know, it's a funny thing, as a result of, 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 you know, meeting a lot of people, yeah. being the side man guy, um, and, and having, you know, the band with Slim Jim, and Lee w yeah. with Phantom Rocker and Slick and, and them having worked around with Carl Perkins before, we were invited to London to do um, uh, a Carl Perkins tribute thing. It was kind of cool because doing a tribute before the guy actually dies is kind of cool, you know, because they usually wait till you're gone, then you get the tribute. But we did this great live show with uh, George and Ringo and Eric Clapton and I was in heaven again, you know, and you know, it was just, uh, Great experience. It wasn't really so much of a sideman thing that one. That was just I was just happy to be there. Are you on that third song? What's that? Are you on that third song? 
Yeah, somewhere. Where's your pointer? Yes, I am. Um, where's my little pointer thingy? Um, that's me, right there. There's Lee Rocker, Eric Clapton, George Harrison, Carl Perkins, myself, Ringo, Dave Edmonds, and Slim Jim. Kind of in that order. And you like the hair, right? Yeah. <laughs> Looks like a helmet. So this was 1985. Um, you then went on and did stuff with Bo Diddley in the 90s and In Your Face, Little Caesar. There's a, there's a string of things there that took you up to the mid-90s when you got a bit kind of... Um, well, in the early 90s, um, I had a band, and actually, that's Bo Diddley. I was doing a video on Hollywood Boulevard in L.A., and he... I see him walking down the street, and I'm going, who is that guy? Because he had a camera, one of the early, this is like 1990-ish maybe, yeah. and he had a video camera, and he was following women around up the back of their skirts. <laughs> and I'm going, who is this dirty old man? And I get close, I go, Jesus Christ, it's Bo Diddley. So I go, <laughs> and I introduce myself, and I say, you know what? I, my band's right around the corner, and, and we're, we're making a video. Can you be in it? And he came back and we shot overnight and he hung with us the whole night and it was absolute another one of those little funny perks you get you oh, know that was a video for in your face your no face. that was a video for a, a, a band that i had okay that i don't like so i'm not even going to say the name okay <laughs> dirty white boy right and then little caesar little caesar uh, was a la band that was a, a pretty edgy band and i sat in again, sideman-wise, because their guitar player got kicked out, and um, ended up that the other band, Dirty White Boy, broke up. I joined Little Caesar, um, which went sort of sideways after we had done, we did a really good European tour, actually. And it looks then, like you did commit with the hair this time as well, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I yeah, let yeah. the hair grow out for that yeah, one. Yeah. Um, and Noel Redding? Was and oh, no, from Jimi Hendrix. Um, we had a, a mutual friend named Frankie LaRocca, and, and um, Noel would come over to the States, and we would do this thing called Noel Redding and Friends, which we would, um, we would just do a bunch of Hendrix tunes, and we would play in these pubs and stuff, and we'd have an absolute right, and Noel was like, what, what, a, what a great guy, what a great guy. But you know, if you come back to the big picture, all of this is as a result, as much, you know, as part of the perks parts from being the side man, and getting the notoriety from that where, where you do meet people, you know, that you normally would never have met before. Okay, and th this brings us up to, well, 93, you were with, um, with Noel, and you got abandoned ship here when, and you're looking quite different on the right-hand side. Okay, this is, I can't stand this anymore. I hate music, I hate the music business. I don't want to record, I don't want to play. I sold every guitar except for two. And those are the two guitars that I that are on the iconic records on the, the Lennon and the Bowie records. Everything else is gone. Oh, this is around the time of the whole Seattle thing with the grunge bands like um, with Nirvana and everything were coming along. Yeah, but that had nothing to do with it. Right, it was okay. it wasn't that the Seattle thing. And it, it was me. It just I just um, I always told myself the day that I woke up and I hated what I was doing, uh, I would I'd find something else to do. And and the day came, and. Um, it was very. Um, it was a. It was a weird time. So I took four years. Uh, I turned into this guy, who had an actual job, who never had one in his life before. You, you know, doing. I was selling uh, timeshare. <laughs> no. Now you know I have no humility. I will talk <laughs> about this shit um, in Lake Tahoe. So at least I lived in a beautiful place, and um, so... Did the subject of your previous life ever come up? Well, I tried to keep it quiet, but yeah. I had to make up a resume, a fake resume. Yeah. What was I going to put? <laughs> previous employer, David Bowie, John Lennon, Ian Hunter, <laughs> Carl Perkins, Eric Clapton. I mean, they would have thrown me out the front door. They would have said, okay, we got a loony in here. Get it out of here. Um, so I think I just made up some BS and, right. and, and ended up doing it for a bit. For four years. 
Yeah. For four years. So did you do well? Did you go very high up the ladder? I sucked. Right. <laughs> I hated the clients, I hated the job, and I hated the product. Other than yeah. that, it was nice. But I did like where I lived. I, 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 it gave me a different point of view on life, which I think is exactly what I needed to do. It was around this time that you got into dogs, you, the new fizz and things as well. Yeah, I got into. Yeah, I, 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 I'm a, a, a Newfoundland dog lover. So, and this is around the time I got my first one when I was up there. Um, and anyway, swearing. I mean, people would try to find me, uh, and and have me come in and play. I just wouldn't return phone calls, and and I thought, you know, I'm done. I really am done. Um, until. Uh, well, you got um, you got a call again, didn't you, for, from somebody um, that uh, was asking if you could. Oh, this guy yeah. again. He's back. Yeah. Keeps so coming back. This guy. Um, so this is two thousand. You got a call from David's secretary asking if you could play for a couple of days. Yeah, there was a. I, I got this really cryptic email to get to contact this person at the office, and, and I hadn't seen David for a while, so I didn't know her because she had been employed after. I, I fell out of touch, and I got in touch at the office, and I got some kind of bizarre story about how he was producing some artists, and he wanted me to come in and play on it, which was a big story. Uh, he needed a guitar player again because uh, 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 his previous guitar player uh, and him were no longer working together, and, uh, and here I come again, call in the fill-in side guy. Um, and I, I thought about it for a second, and I said, okay, I always told myself, if and when the right thing came by, I would look at it. Um, anyway, they flew me into New York, um, and it was really funny, too, because it was, uh, it's, oh, uh, David would just like to have to fly you in and have a play with the band. I mean, this sounds mysteriously like an audition. I did one of those about 30 years ago, okay? <laughs> so I came in and did it, and um, it went fine. We had a blast, and, and this was in New York, wasn't it? This is in New York, yeah. This actual picture here from this. That's it. That's at rehearsals. Yeah. By that guitar, I'm saying around 2000. Yeah. Um, so the only way I know what year it is by what guitar I'm playing. You didn't go straight from the time show into that. In between, you were doing things. Like in between, there was a David short. David Coverdale. Yeah, um, David Coverdale from White Snake of all things did uh, like a bluesy sort of a, a rock record called Into the Light, and I wrote and recorded that with him because he lives in Lake Tahoe where I was living. Um, and that's as far as that went. I didn't want to know about anything beyond that and kind of went back to what I was doing when um, DB got in touch with me. Okay. And just to reverse a tiny bit for the Lennon fans here, you got the Lennon anthology sent to you in 98 um, that Yoko sent to you. Right. And John... Gives you a name check on. Yeah, it's really funny. It, you know, the anthology, the, it, it's a box set with a, the blue box, if anybody's got it. It's the, the Lennon anthology. And the, anyway, I'm listening to the thing, and what there was outtakes, lots of outtakes on there. And then I'm listening to it, and all of a sudden, I, right before the solo comes up, I hear John scream out my name. I'm going, holy shit. So I'm like a little kid. You know, if anybody's got a kid here that, that has a favorite movie and they'll watch it until they drive their parents completely out of the house, well, that was me. I kept going back to the spot, as John was said, Earl Slick, and I go back again. And I must have done it like <laughs> 20 times a day for like a week. I, think I, I blew a hole in the CD because, you know, it, it's still, I miss John and it really meant a lot, you know. And, uh, and as far as the sideman thing goes to, in the context of, of John more than anybody else, I felt the least like a sideman in that situation than anybody else I'd ever worked with, you know, which is, you know, one of the reasons I'm so happy, you know, that Yoko's done this and I can be here yeah. doing this because it, it brings back a lot of that for me, which is really cool. And had things turned out differently, it may be that um, you were in that band a lot longer than, than you may have. You we might, you might we have don't know, you know, know exactly. and we'll never know. Okay. So sorry, going back, to, you were back with Bowie for the Hours mini tour, and uh, no, sorry for the Heathen, and this is the BBC radio show there that we just saw. Oh, the Heathen tour, yeah. There is actually no. Is that here? Yeah, that's the Meltdown Festival. And we who took that. that photo? I think I took that photo. <laughs> <laughs> Myself, Robert Smith, Mark Plotty, who was um, doing some co-producing and some guitar, and you know that guy over there, and. What's that one from, Blamo? At the top there, that yeah. looks like... That's, that suit says 2002. That's yeah. the Heathen tour. Yeah. 
But yep. it's, it could and be. my glasses. I remember the glasses. That could be here again, could it not? Mm, don't know about that. And that is also that's, 2002. That's here. That's here, right? Yeah, the festival for the heathen and uh, low thing. That, so that's 2002. Yeah. Yeah. What do we got next? Ah, solo album. Um, this one, this is an interesting record that was supposed to, not supposed to be a record. Um, I just started writing just for some brain therapy and um, mentioned to Mark Plotty, um, who had, you know, worked with, um, and was working with David on some engineering and producing. And um, I said, I'm doing these tracks. I said, you know, I'm thinking about ma making some proper demos. So what do you think? So we cut, we cut some things, and I liked them. But you know, so they were going to be instrumental, and um, during it was really funny. During one conversation, I was talking to Mark, not realizing that that uh, uh, DB was in the room with him, and he said, "So you're not inviting me to sing on the album?" He says, "I mean, you know, uh, you think I can do that?" I said, "Well, yeah, I got to think about that." So that started <laughs> the ball rolling. Of I said, "You know what? Maybe I should get a hold of some of my other favorite singers." And, and have them come in. And so we, we got a hold of uh, my friend Joe Elliott from Def Leppard and uh, Martha Davis. Remember the motels? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and um, Royston Langdon from Space Hog, which is they're from your neighborhood, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, we're, we're aware of them. They're a big Bowie fan. Yeah, love oh, very big Bowie fans. Yeah. Um, oh, excuse me, Robert Smith from The Cure. Yeah. Uh, sang a song, so we ended up with with like about three quarters vocals and a, and a quarter of uh, of the album being instrumental. And that was a big big album at the time, it seemed to be anyway. But you're saying it wasn't the best selling of, of your solo album. No, uh, um, critically acclaimed, didn't sell well, but they don't always do. So yeah, okay. And then around the same time, you uh, went in for recording of Reality in 2003. Actually, we were yeah. mixing. Zigzag while we were recording reality because okay. I was in studio A in the big studio and David was in studio B in the All little right. studio. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things about this particular slide on the right here, what's going on there exactly? Can you see that one? Oh, that one, you yeah. know, sometimes certain people could get very serious on stage and stoic and all that night. I just like to take the piss, so I would just try to catch him when he was really trying to, 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 to be that <laughs> the actor guy and making funny faces. As you can see, he's letting loose a little bit. He's ready to he's ready to crack up during there. But I, I would just just for giggles, I would just do that once in a while just to entertain myself, and also because I could get away with it. And I heard something about on that particular tour, which was a great band, by the way, wasn't it? That that band was that one. that reality band. Um, and I played with some great guys. With um, there we are, um, myself. I can't see Sterling Campbell, uh, Catherine, Catherine Russell. Russell, the blonde guy, uh, Gail Ann Dorsey, Mike Garson, and Jerry Leonard. Oh, here's me sneaking a smoke and a Red Bull <laughs> on stage. On stage. Well, you know what? Th there was a. Jerry used to do this one song just with David and Jerry, and it would give me like about a four minute window <laughs> to sneak off. That was Loving the Alien. Yeah. What's that? Loving the, the Alien, alien. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I would be able to sneak off to the side, and if somebody was lurking back there with a camera and caught me, you see how I'm crunched out in the back, right? Because all the security guys are trying to get you, you put your cigarette out and all that. Um, and there's a story behind the hat that Jerry's wearing. Oh, the hat. The hat of shame. If you made a real whopping mistake at rehearsal or even at a gig, you you had to wear that hat uh, for. I mean, you didn't wear it all day. You wore it for like you know, like a song. Um, there are no pictures of it, but a certain person did actually wear that hat at rehearsal, having made some lyrical mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> no um, pictures. That's a shame. I've never yeah. seen a photo of it. No. I I don't think any photos were allowed, and I'm sure if they were taken, they've been destroyed by now, so don't, ex don't expect to see that photo in the book. But I might no put that one in Jerry in there just for yeah. to see what happens. If well, I think there's one of David. I've got Photoshop. Oh. Yeah. oh. <laughs> Make sure you put, give yourself proper credit for the no, photo. I don't think I will, actually. 
All right, so um, I think we're being asked yeah, to move got, on. We so got going, the, yeah, we got the, uh, where are we? we could, so we're going to have to skip through some of this, but you went through Slinky Vagabond. Um, Let's skip right up to where we, what we just finished so we can get these guys. If you guys want to ask some questions and stuff, I'd love to um, talk to you guys. Okay, so, so you went through the dolls, you went, um, but then you got a phone call. Um, uh, do you want to mention this about? Oh, the, the fire. Yeah. All right, I've got, I just got the highs and I'll make this quick. Um, Long story short, in May of 2012, I went out for a ride with a buddy of mine who had just built that car and, and put a bad fuel line in it, and it blew up with us in it. So um, it made the local news, which uh, a certain person who had been very quietly making a record without telling anybody, uh, saw the article, and I get the email, how are you, did you get out okay, yeah, I'm fine, 10 minutes later, are you busy? What do you <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. I'm working. Uh, what are you doing in July? I'm I'd like, get to the fucking point, will you? <laughs> Finally, about 30 emails later, it's, well, I'm making a record. I need you to come and play on it. Are you free during these dates? And then we got the next day. <clears throat> and that's how... And how hard you That's keep, how weird shit happens in this business. Keep Stun, how hard was that to do? Because you were doing interviews with like Guitar Old Magazine and... Oh, yeah, magazine. we had to keep quiet. I had to keep quiet from May until January. And, um, you know, I'm doing cover stories for Guitar Magazines and everybody's, oh, what's David Bowie doing? I, go, I don't know, I haven't talked to him. <laughs> Is he going to record another album? I said, I probably not, you know. <laughs> I mean, if, you know, we got the word. And you guys know, because it popped out of nowhere. I mean, um, I think there might have been a leak or two here, but they didn't, if they did, I ain't taking responsibility for them, because it wasn't no, me. They were, they were covered up well. OK, so that brings us, I think, um, are we going to show a, a short film first? No, I think that we happens when we're done. OK, so we're going to open over to some questions with the audience, if that's OK with you. Um, guy back there. There's a couple of guys going over microphones. If you could just wait till the mic comes to you. Yeah, yeah, whoever yeah. you're closest yeah. to. Um, just want to go back to the Diamond Dogs tour and, yeah. uh, you know, fantastic music on that tour and uh, should have been called the Earl Slick show. Thank you. David Bowie. But, um, yeah, you played fantastic solos on things like Moon Age Daydream and, to be honest, we spent about 40 years looking for some video of you playing on that tour and uh, there doesn't seem to be anything around. There, you know Is, what? Does anything exist? There, there was very little documentation of that thing. I heard that maybe at, at the BMA, is there something? There's some footage that hadn't been yeah, there's like black and white. We saw some little clips, yeah. yeah. We, we really wanted to see a, a it's bit not, of the It's, it's not there. No, it's, it, not no there. it's really weird because he's always been really good about documenting stuff. I mean, and, and even as far as photos go, there's not much even photo documentation of that. No, there's, there's not much of you playing on that. You know, the occasional shot with you in the background. You hear me, but you don't yeah. see anybody. We hear you brilliantly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Okay, Jens thank told, you Jens thinks they filmed the whole show that uh, they used for Frank Factor. But right, but it's it's still, it, it, was, it was not a good filming job either. It was, right. it was um, no, it does not mean, I'm sure at this point, if there was anything decent, it would be out, but it wasn't done. Okay, we'll stop looking, but uh, it'd be lovely yeah. to see if Keep it, looking, it, it if you find up, something. Yeah. <laughs> Facebook me and tell me you've got it. And we will. We yeah. will. Thank you very much. Great, man. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, on that, on that, while well, I'm on, yeah, that, cool. on the subject, yeah, yeah. The, the sound you got there, I, um, you sent me an email actually about five years ago and ah. told me how you got the sound. How did and I get it? MXR Phase 90, a Marshall half stack, and you were using the, the, the SG. You got it. As simple as that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, are, are you likely to use that, that, that sort of cutting sound you got? It's such a fantastic sound. I, I think it was the best sound I've ever heard you Thank get. Thank you. Are, are you ever are you going to use that again, that kind of that technique and that sound? It, it was, you know, something that was very you know, exciting sound. I, I've actually been hitting on stuff like that again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we look forward to hearing, hearing some more of that. that was well, I, I, you just might be by the end of the year. So Fantastic. Brilliant. It's a great side. Uh, were you, just as another final question on that, were you, were you, you the pickups you're using there, were you using Dimarzi? You were working with Larry Dimarzi at the time. Yeah, at the time it probably was a Dimarzio pickup yeah, in that yeah. guitar, Fantastic. and it was a 65 yeah. SG. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Which I still have. Oh, that really? was one yeah. of the two guitars I didn't sell when I jumped ship. Oh, I'd like to see you playing it again I sometime. still have it. <laughs> That'd be good. Thanks very much. Great. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Is this one? Yes, it is. Uh, 
Oh, um, oh, there you are. Lo lovely to see you, and thanks very much for... Uh, I, I think a lot of us here, I mean, me included, um, have heard tons of your stuff without realising quite how much you brought to each of those records. And uh, So thank you very much for that. And the question I was going to ask you was, um, a sideman in you, in your life, your working life, is it about sort of um, parking the ego to some extent and, and being prepared to be, as you were saying at the beginning, a kind of supporting act almost? rather than being the main star of the show. Is that a difficult thing to pull off? I actually, you know, it comes to me very naturally. Um, so the idea of the book isn't, isn't the downside of it. it it's, it's all sides of it. In other words, the good bits and the bad bits. But um, doing it, it comes naturally to me. If it's with the right people, I find it very easy to do, actually. Yeah. Because I, I love doing it and love playing, especially if it's the right act. Thanks. Chop over here. Yeah. Uh, this might be a bit of a dead end, but... Um, <laughs> 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 I know what this one is. <laughs> no, it's, it's the dreaded Wikipedia. Did you ever play with Jim Diamond? I did, actually. Yeah. yeah um, I had a... Uh, Jim Diamond for, uh, is... Um, for anybody who doesn't know who he is, he had some hits here probably in the 80s and 90s, he's, uh, a, he's a Glaswegian, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. and um, he's a great um, sort of rhythm and blues singer, and um, yeah, we had, a, we had a band for a short period in the States, and it, it didn't work well, and his visa ran out, and he came back here, and, and he just exploded with hit records, yeah. I loved him, yeah, great guy. Chop here. Um, your guitar work on Station to Station is some of the, my favorite guitar stuff, so thank you for that. Well, thank you. And um, I just wondered, have you signed any non-disclosure agreements lately? <laughs> <laughs> Give that man a prize. I, I'm surprised it took you guys that long to get to that one. Okay. Would, would this, you believe him if he said no? This is what I'm going to tell you. There are no live dates this year to do with the person that you're talking about. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say, because it's the truth. There's, there's no master plan going on between now and the end of the year. There are no live dates. What about next year? What's that? <laughs> I don't know anything about next year. Hi there. Um, <laughs> over here. Well, Sunday. What's going on Sunday? Am I playing Sunday? Yeah. <laughs> Just checking with the legal affairs department here. Hi, I'm over here, the other side. I can hear you, but look, I can't. Look, 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 the other way. Wave. Down. Ah, OK. Fat ball bloke. Um, what is the most spinal tap moment of your career? I, That's the whole section of the it, book. It, um, <laughs> well, you know, stupid or funny or... Um, yeah, just a funny sort of out of the blue, shit, what am I doing here? How well, is this Well, burning happened? the damn house down in Canada was pretty good, I'd say, you know. Uh, oh, the car fire wasn't too bad either. Um, to, a few TVs flying out windows back in the 70s when it was cool until I started after paying for them. <laughs> Never been trapped in a plastic pod or anything? No, 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 no. And what about that on the David Live tour, on those dates, the Diamond Dogs tour, where the cherry picker would get stuck occasionally? Did you yeah, and we'd all sit down pointing at him, laughing, yeah. and then when he got down, he'd, he'd give us all hell. <laughs> <laughs> right, anybody else? Ah, I know Sorry, this, here, this lady here. Get her a microphone. Hello. Hello. Um, did you end up recording anything with Mick Mars? Actually, yeah, Mick Mars um, from Motley. Um, uh, we went in the studio about a year and a half ago with um, myself, Mick Mars, and David Johansson um, after the New York Dolls Motley tour, and we recorded a couple of tracks. We were going to continue, but we all got busy. So we got two tracks sitting there, and it, uh, I don't know. We'll see what happens to them. A chat with the Mick and Keith show? Yeah. Hi, You're supposed to bang on it. Testing one time. It's a question regarding 
when somebody comes into the studio with a song and it's a very, very small idea of a song and then you get drawn to do, obviously, why you're called in and you put so much into the song and then suddenly it just says written by whoever and you're not getting the credit, how, how do you handle that? Because there must be, that's why you're, you're called in to do the stuff, isn't it? And you must bring so much to it, but do you find that hard? Um, you know, it depends who you're working with. There's a fine line with, with, with what people consider songwriting. I, I consider the song the lyric and the melody. And if I'm brought in to play signature licks, to me, that is what I'm getting paid to embellish the lyric and the melody. I'm getting paid a fee for that. Now, if somebody wants to be generous enough to give me some writing on it, I'm not going to give it back to them. Yeah. But, you know, uh, that's a real sticky wicket, that one, yeah. as you guys would say. Um, yeah. There's no really good answer for that because it, it depends on person to person how that works out. But it, it, sometimes it is frustrating when you've done something that has given a song a whole flavor and you... Yeah. yeah. Never mind. Okay. See a hand over there? Hello, Earl. Hey. Hey. Um, I was just, um, it's kind of a two-part question, really. One is going back to the Carl Perkins gig. And uh, just what was your take, like, working with those guys specifically, you know, uh, say, like, Dave Edmonds, who's, like, monster rockabilly mm -hmm. guitar player and just, I mean... He's, he's like one guy I've always looked up to, especially, you know, like Rock Pile and all the things that he did here. How was, how was that experience for you, like, working with him, seeing as, like, your kindred spirits musically? You know, um, have you seen the film, the, the, the Call Perk? You, no, should, you, you really need to, if you're an Edmonds fan yeah. or, or Rockabilly, you need to get it. Um, it was great. Yeah. I mean, the, watching... The guys, I mean, Edmonds, even though he's more of my generation, or maybe just a little before me, he, his mindset was that of Carl Perkins and of all that stuff. And, and um, it was great to work with him. It was great to be immersed in all of that with all of the guys. I mean, they were all wonderful. And there's a highlight in there, if you're a real rockabilly fan, where Carl plays by himself. George makes him do it. <laughs> and no band. Yeah. Just Carl with his, and it's like a mind blowing performance. It, it's like maybe five minutes long, if that in the film. That alone is worth getting the film for. Yeah, I think I'm going to do that. And the other question I had is like uh, today, given all the people that you've worked with over the years in your career, is there anybody left today living that you would say, oh man, if I had the opportunity, if the phone call came, who would that be? Or are you pretty much like. Keith Richards, in a heartbeat. Yeah. Like expensive winos, that kind of Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Or, or even sitting in the studio playing some blues, yeah. whatever. I'll take anything. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. You're that, friends that with the rest it. of the guys. Like Ron Wood, for example, you're fr pretty friendly with him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but I've never um, hands on work with Ronnie, you okay. know, because he, he's a Bowie fan and he will come by the gigs and yeah, say yeah. hi. Um, Anybody else? Yeah, got a couple over here. Hi, yeah, there was um, uh, some footage that was filmed during the Double Fantasy sessions for about a week. And I've gone on YouTube, like the other gentleman, and there's nothing there. And I, and I don't know, there's something about, he was in an interview, John, then, and he said that he looked like a, bird, a skinny bird. <laughs> yeah, and he said that it, he'd washed it in a bathtub, but apparently Yoko might have it locked up in the Dakota somewhere. You, you know what? what? This has been the biggest mystery for 33 years <laughs> because... Every once in a while, I see something that pops up that looks like it was done during then, and you might have seen a little bit of it tonight. Yeah, the Yoko thing at the right. beginning. Yeah, yeah um, but we don't know. I mean, logic tells me it would have turned up by now if it was there. Logic also tells me if somebody wanted it hidden, it's hidden. So, I mean, I, if it's there, I'm the first guy who would love to get, get his hands on it, you know? Because I was under the impression that you know, because John didn't like it, maybe Yoko thought, well, that would be the last image of John, and so she kept it away from the public because... It, it could be. It could be. I mean, it's, it's all conjecture, and there's rumors all over the place about that, and, and, and I really don't know. I'm, I'm as, as much in the dark about it as anybody else is. Good question, though, because it, gets, it does get asked, and there's really... Well, good question, bad answer. I don't know. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I just want to say I really love your guitar work, and 
station to station. Fantastic. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's get one we didn't get yet. We'll get back to you. What age did you start playing guitar and who was your inspiration and do you play any other instruments? Um, I started, my inspiration to actually get involved playing music was the Beatles. The thing that really kicked me into gear was the Stones. So that's when I got really serious with the guitar and that would have been mm, mid-1964. Um, and I don't play any other instruments. Okay. Well... I'll, I'll, I'll play a bass track here and there in the studio, but I wouldn't say that I'm a bass player. And I actually did put a piano track on something, on one note. <laughs> Does that count? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, hey, yeah. it's uh, White Orion. You all right? Um, I just had a question. Is there, are we going to, should we expect any kind of more solo projects coming up? Do you have anything under the Yeah, I'm working, on, I'm working on a few things right now. I have... Um, uh, there's a little film we're going to show at the end of, of something that, that I'm putting together as we speak. Um, and then recording, I'll, I have a band called Outliers. Um, and um, I'm working on that. And I'm working on a, an instrumental record also of this summer. Um, no release dates on either one of them yet. Okay, cool. And Diane says hi, by the way, from Pennsylvania. Diane, I... <laughs> <laughs> what, to say. She made her way all the way to England. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay, we'll do Karima, and then we'll get to, to you in a second. Are there any plans to tour the re-release for the Phantom Rock and Stick stuff? We tried. Um, <laughs> we, we did a few gigs last year. Matter of fact, I'm going to be seeing Slim Jim Phantom next week. Um, we have an event that we're doing in uh, Milwaukee. What's that? Oh my God! What are you doing here? Slim Jim, come on! You got to stand up. You got to stand up. <laughs> Good one, Matlock. I'm busting you too. And that guy next to you is next. Um, Anyway, we, we tried to do a few gigs, and, and, and they were great, but our schedules are crazy. Jim's off one place, Lee's someplace else, I'm somewhere, and we just can't seem to... Well, well, it's two of us. Is Lee in the room, too? Am I missing something? If he is, let's grab some gear. Hello. I hear a voice. Hello. Oh, hello um, back there. I notice you've got a couple of guitars on stage. Or... Yeah. I wonder if you're going to play anything for us tonight. Um, they're, they're here. Just a little something. For security. Go on. Okay, a little it, something. Okay, do you, have, do you have a lick that you Go like? Go on. All right. Uh, oh, I tried to avoid this. That wasn't prime, but that was actually my wife. Did you do that? Question. Oh, no, you. <laughs> Last time you're oh, doing honest, this. I promise it wasn't set up. <laughs> I threatened him with that. That was the thing. <laughs> How about something from the station to station? <laughs> Alamore actually taught me that way. <laughs> Do you know the golden That's an insider. You'll figure that one out later. Do you know the golden years, Riff? Really? <laughs> All right. I don't know what else I know. Any more requests? I forgot them all. Sweet feet. Which one? Sweet feet. Oh, God, that's complicated. <laughs> and Sorry. the last time I played it was 1974. That's like, that's, oh, that's, 
I won't remember that one either. Rebel, Rebel. Ah, Rebel, okay. Thank you for the easy one. These ringers are gonna kill me. We were going to show a film of Diamond Dogs. Is that worth just giving us that riff? That, um, we have a film of Diamond Dogs? No, originally we were going to play Diamond Dogs from the reality tour. Oh, Diamond Dogs. No, we were. We're not going to show yeah. that. We got something else. That's right. But do you want to just play the riff? Oh, Diamond Dogs. Yeah. <laughs> Is that where you were going with that? Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, I got to remember this one. <laughs> What's that? Oh, what do I got? That was Valentine's Day, right? Valentine's Day, yeah. Right, yeah. What's, what's your favorite song to play? What's your favorite? Where I, I, ah. Just in front of the nail. What's your favorite song? I'm deficit door nail, so. <laughs> your favorite Bowie track that you played there? My favorite Bowie track that I played on. Yeah, of course. And could you play some of that? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> I, I tell you, I, th I think that the ones that I've actually recorded, um, Going back in the day, I think Stay, um, Station to Station, the title track, um, Reality, the title track, and Valentine's Day from the next day. We are just Stay. What's that? Stay. We hear a riff from Stay. You want it again, right? Once wasn't enough. The whole, who said the whole thing? And you can come up and play it. I need the band for the rest of it. Yes, sir. Um, you, come, you seem like a very humble guy when I had a question about, about the royalties and all that. You were like, you know, hey, it is what it is, blah, right. blah, blah. And the fact that you didn't get the call for the Bowie project you thought you'd be right. doing, but you still go back for the next day and everything else. Right. And, you know, I'm pretty sure, like, everyone in this room probably thinks, like, you know, Bowie walks on water or whatever, you know. Um, with all that in mind, if you'd committed to work for someone else and then you got the call from Bowie, how would you deal with that? I'd stay where I was. I'd stay, I'd stay by my commitments. I would never do yeah, that. Yeah. No, I figured it would be, yeah. I'm quite, I'm quite um, impressed. You know how you said like, that the inspiration about early, when you were a kid, like the rock and roll thing, a bit like for me and my generation, the punk rock thing was if it pissed off older people, it was great. And... I need to let go of some of that stuff, but I still do it. So I'm thinking like, when you get the call from Bowie, like after years go by and it happens again and then it happens again, that you're able to resist the thing to go, you know what, David, fuck you this time. <laughs> and I'm kind of curious as to like, 
you know, I, I don't know that I'd be able to do that. Let, I've let never me, worked let, with Bowie, so I don't know. I'll tell you what, if it was a matter of saying fuck you, David, I would have and I wouldn't be on the, I wouldn't be on the new album. So, sure. I mean, you know, um, it's a double-edged sword because, but the thing is, is that what you got to understand, if you end up as a sideman with the right guy at the right age, and that gives you the boost that you need to get someplace that you might not have gotten, you've got to take that into consideration as time goes on. And realize that as the side man, here goes the, the whole ups and downs part. It's not my band. It was Elvis, it was David Bowie, it's Madonna. You know, it, it's solo artists. They, they get to pick what they want to do and who they want to do it with. So if, if he decides to make a record and it's a whole different group of guys, I mean, I'm not going to like it, you know, maybe, but on the other hand, it's totally within his rights. It's, it's his thing. It's not my band. That's what you got to remember as, as the side man thing. So, you know, you got to be able to take a smack on the head once in a while and not take it too seriously and be thin skinned. Because if you're thin skinned, you better get a regular job. <laughs> How do you do that? I have no idea. I tried it, I, I failed. Yes, sir. And had to what? And grew to absolutely hate it. You know, uh, have you ever got a guitar that you really thought this is it, and then found out it was completely you couldn't do anything with it? I mean, obviously you can do. You can I don't think so. <laughs> huh? Okay. Um, have we got from who have we not heard from? You still got the mic. You might as well use it. Oh, you got a mic. So yeah. he who owns the mic. Hey. Um, <clears throat> Did you, you never intended to be a sideman, did you? Is no. it something that kind See, of that's the whole idea of falling into the you, you know being, you wanted to be in the bands and stuff? Like yeah, that? it just it <clears throat> happened. It was the weirdest thing. I mean, I, I didn't wake up one day and say, "Wow, I wonder which big solo artist I could work with when I grow up and <laughs> get professional." <laughs> it was the furthest thing from my you know at the time it would have been like, "Oh, maybe I could play with Elvis." I never even thought about it. You know, um, I was doing my thing. I was playing a lot. I had great bands. Um, and, you know, when the opportunity came up, it was, I mean, who the hell could turn that down? But is it, is it something you still try and get away from, or are you kind of no, I, You know what, it, I've what embraced the fact that I do it pretty damn good, yeah. um, and I enjoy doing it with the right, with the right people. So, oh. what's to argue about? Was it's all any, good. Was there any point at all where you wondered if you had made the right decision in terms of the instrument. Did you ever want to be the singer or did you ever want to, or was it always guitar? I'm not a frustrated singer or okay. a frustrated drummer or, or anything else. I love my guitar, that's what I love playing. Okay. Yeah. Right, so. Yep. Yes, manager. You have a question? Two more questions. Oh, yeah. So, oh. <laughs> no, we've got, we've got time for two more questions, so. Okay, we'll take who, this guy who have we not him. heard from? Yeah. I, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we heard some great licks there from station to station. I can hear, but I can't I'm see. I'm sorry. Oh, there um, you are. And I was thinking, I, I, I've heard that not everybody remembers the making of Station to Station. It's I do. It's such an epic record, but what was the process like of creating those songs? I can't imagine they, they just happen fully formed. Um, so, so what, how, how were the sessions and how it, did they It depends prevent? who you ask that question. I'll tell you what I know, um, to be relatively accurate, is that it was, it was a pretty loose thing, but it was a band. It was myself and Dennis Davis and, and uh, George Murray and Carlos Alomar, and then brought in Roy Bitten from Bruce Springsteen's band to play piano, who was an old friend of mine. And David brought in the songs. He had a lot of the lyrics. He had a lot of the melodies. He just needed us to give it its continuity and put together riffs here and there to make it happen. And some of it was done on the fly, you know, um, like the title track, the beginning of it, and all the feedback and stuff. Um, but it was, a, it was, a, it was a kind of a band effort. There wasn't anybody in that room that was doing arrangements or, or showing David the chords, uh, you know, contrary to what you might read or see by other folks that were involved in that. No, I mean, they, they, they've evolved into, you know, 
released quite strange songs, and I'm, I'm sure that was. Yeah, they they they, they, they happened actually organically, and everybody in there had an equal part in that. Yeah. Which is probably why the record is still holds up. Yeah. Credit to one you. more. Okay, it's here. Make it a good one. Hey, um, back to the Beatles. I I'm probably going to get lynched for this, but I'm not a Beatles fan. I've never understood what the big attraction was. So what was it for you in the beginning? It went through stages, okay? At the very beginning, the attraction was, is I grew up in the 50s. And if you know anything, if, you know, take a sociology class about the 1950s, yeah, um, yeah. and <laughs> its states was very oppressive. Matter of fact, Elvis in the 50s was to what punk was in, in, in the 70s. It was, it was that whole thing. And it started a whole thing going, and then it kind of died off. And then the Beatles came at a time where everybody wore the same clothes, ate the same food. Yeah. It, we lived in a very regimented society where you just didn't step out. And here come these four kids from England playing their own instruments and singing, because normally you had like a backup band and then a singer. Right, but this was a, a rock, a real rock and roll band that had these clothes that we'd never seen before and this hair we'd never seen. And the, it was the right band at the right time. There was more to it than just the music. Okay. It was, it was I would call it, uh, you know, I, I, this may sound like ridiculous. The Beatles caused a, a, a very serious social revolution that put the world on its ear. And a lot of that had to do with them being as unusual, and then as they went on, John Lennon being as, as, as outspoken and honest about things, which nobody else had the balls to do to the point where the US government was after him for 10 years. Thank so there, there's a lot of value in all that. I think that's a good note to end on. Yeah, yeah. Those meltdown. So yep. Thanks a Great lot. Great guys, Thank, thank you. you. Earl Slick on guitar. Earl Slick! Let me see. David Bowie, John Lennon, Ringo Starr, Eric Clapton, Robert Smith, George Harrison, Joe Elliott, John Waite. The concept behind the tour is to get a group of my best buddies that are actually singers as well to put together a really nice show of our own and then every city have a guest that we just admire that could come up and, and, and do a number of songs with us. We got some characters here. I mean, uh, not to mention great players. And Working class hero, something. Mark Hudson being a character. And he's a great friend, he's a great record producer. I'm kind of a jack of all trades, master of none. The stank that Earl has is something that's God-given, not something you can teach. And there's not another guitar player on this planet that plays as great as he does. I don't like you. I'm Keenan Duffy, fashion designer for the stars, author and tap dancer, musician, and anything else that comes my way. Hanging around no more. Jen Schwartz and I have been collaborating. We were talking about doing a cover, and of course I want to do a Stones cover. So she picked Play With Fire, and she put together a killer arrangement that we did live with Neva Kine, her band. We actually just recently recorded it, and it sounds it's killer. It's great. Slick has some pretty amazing friends from so many different genres of music and so many different sort of worlds that he can move in because he's such a versatile guitarist. Michael Houghton, a.k.a. Johnny Fear. I pretty much just at the front. Stage is full of instruments I don't need to worry about playing. American blues and some Delta blues, as well as some of my favorite tunes of, of people that I've played with. There won't be a lot of that, but there will be some of it in there. Done the way that I would approach it, as opposed to the way the original songs were recorded. 
it's going to be casual. I want this to be a, a, a personal experience between who's on stage and the audience. So it's kind of a, a, a mutual back and forth thing instead of here's the band, here's the audience, here's the show, see you by It's something that would be more intimate, almost like I was doing it in my house. Four musicians who've never met each other and who've had like very separate, different musical lives to sort of come together in one place is really something magical. And to do it with your friends, what's better than that?